I started this job tonight and I'm still shaking now that I'm home under the covers. A little backstory. I just moved to a new town a few weeks ago. Coming from the upper colder Midwest, marching California was absolutely wonderful. Even with the rain that we had gotten in the first couple of weeks, the sunshine and 60 degree weather in the early spring was almost like a fairy tale. I had gone to my apartment complex's pool every single day, even when the natives scoffed at me, deeming that it was too cold to tread water. But not for me. Chilled water was nothing compared to the deep freeze I had just come from. There was, however, a strange thing that I had noticed. Our local pool had a sign that very clearly and in large red letters said, The pool closes at 6pm. No exceptions. It was a completely different size and font from the regular rule sign, which was older looking and pretty standard. And now I thought that that was odd. Every pool that I had ever been to within apartment complexes and hotels all had much more reasonable pool closing times, typically between 8 or 10 p.m. It didn't bother me too much. But I have always been a night owl and I enjoyed taking an evening dip. Another odd thing was that around 5.45pm, a lifeguard would arrive at the pool and usher everybody out at 6pm. There was no lifeguard during the day, but always right in the dot at 5.45, in would come a guy decked out in bright red shorts and a clean white t-shirt, announcing that we all have to get ready to leave the pool area. It was weird but more annoying than anything else, and I just got over it. Well, yesterday rolled around and I went out to take my daily dip in the water. As I unlocked the gate and I entered the pool area, I caught a little commotion near the clubhouse entrance. A large older gentleman was trying to quietly calm down the guy I recognized as the weekend lifeguard. The lifeguard was maybe a few years older than me, but not much and he always seemed very quiet and reserved. Seeing him like this was very out of character, flailing his arms and shaking his head, slightly raising his voice only to be hushed by the larger man. I took my time organizing my stuff at my usual chair. I'll be honest, I was nosy, and I wouldn't have had as good of a view from within the water. And right as I admittedly had nothing else to mess with, the lifeguard shouted something at the man and he walked off. The man looked more defeated than anything else. Not particularly a rabble-rousing myself, I decided that the drama must be over with and I dove in. I swam a couple of laps, generally enjoying my time. I came up to the edge of the pool right as a larger man was walking by, heading towards the gate. He saw me looking at him and I immediately felt pretty awkward. Not sure if he thought anything of it, but I had just been staring at the man as he was dealing with what was obviously an employee quitting. So to break the uneasy amount of eye contact I found myself in, I simply said, See you tomorrow. God, awkward. I had never even seen him before today, but my brain did not help me socialize too well. I don't have crippling anxiety, per se, but I have never done well with strangers. Actually, he replied, I think we'll have to close the pool for a while this weekend. My lifeguard just quit on me and my weekday guy can't cover the whole week. Sorry. That was just depressing. The guy left and I couldn't bring myself to enjoy the rest of my swim. By the time I finally got out, the man was back with a few clothes signs to hang on the few gates that led to the pool area. I suppose I could have just dealt with cutting back my swimming, but I was new to the area and I didn't have much of a social life. The pool was the only place that I could go to to be out of my apartment, since I work from home. So I figured, hey, maybe I could see if having a lifeguard was actually necessary. I mean, there was no one on duty until 15 minutes before the pool closed. How come the whole pool had to close because of some unsupervised 15 minutes? The man saw me approach and gave me a half smile. You get your fix of swimming in? I'm here just about every day. I said, I don't think I'll actually ever get a fix of it, but why is the pool actually closing? 
Oh, I thought I mentioned. We're not going to have a lifeguard until Monday. Right, but we only get lifeguards right at the end of pool hours. Does it actually have to close? The man kind of looked past me, which was a little unnerving. But I brushed it off and I blamed my normal social anxiety. Well, the lifeguard is to keep people from trying to come in after sundown. He finally answered, more softly than he had been speaking before. We have someone here a little bit before six and to about midnight, every night. We can't have anyone sneaking in and getting in trouble while it's closed. Ah, California, I figured. Someone must have caused some damage to the pool area or something. Just one night, so now they have to close it for everyone. I shrugged, sad but basically satisfied with the answer. I thanked him and I turned to leave. Unless you have any friends who were able to take the position. He piped up, a life back in his voice. I turned and he was looking more at me again. No real experience necessary. Just need to be here on time and not let anybody in. Wi-Fi from the clubhouse reaches to the guard chair. I think our weekday guy mostly tries to catch up on homework and watch stuff on his phone for the most part. It's relatively easy. He smiled. It was the kind of smile that your little brother gives you when he offers to clean your room for a week, just to be player one for a change. Um, sorry, I just moved here. No real friends yet. Oh, none? He didn't say it judgmentally, but it hurt. What about you? Are you free? You're here all the time, yeah? It didn't sound particularly ideal. I mean, I have no social life, so my evenings are spent at home. But sitting around a way for people to not show up didn't sound thrilling. Sorry, I have a good gig that lets me work from home. But I have to be on central time hours, so I can't be up too late. Not entirely true, but not entirely false. I just wasn't interested. Well, surely you don't work on the weekends. And besides, the pay's good. I'll start you at 18 an hour. If I don't find somebody by the end of the week, I'll bump it up to 20 to keep you on a little longer. It's all under the table. I don't need the paperwork for something so short term. I can't say that I'm overly greedy, but that was pretty good pay to do basically nothing. I took his number and I agreed to call him in the morning with a decision. He put up the close signs just in case. Obviously, I took him up on the offer, or I wouldn't be telling you this story. So at around 5pm this evening, I headed to the clubhouse. The man who I end up learning is named Mr. Karras is my new temporary manager. He gives me a generic lifeguard uniform, a lanyard with a key to the pool and it all seems fine. Before I can turn to head out though, he gently grabs my shoulder. Hang on kiddo, there's one more thing and it's the most important. I raise an eyebrow and I face him. His eyes have started staring through me like the day before, and I get a little bit creeped out again. You can't leave the pool area until midnight. You can't let anybody in either, and you can't let anyone out. Something between his tone and his eyes sent a chill down my spine. Out. It's just precautionary. The pool is completely locked down till after midnight, and then you can clean up any messes and head home. He came back to earth and he forced a smile. Do you get me? Uh, sure. Alright, you'll be fine. You have my number too. And with that, he patted the spot on my shoulder he had grabbed, straightened his polo shirt and he walked me out. Creepy. But as a mid-twenties gal, I hate to say I chalked it up a bit to being just a weird older man thing. This could be temporary. A good pay and my pool would be open again. I took a look at some of the notes I took on my phone's notepad to give an approximation of times that things started happening. I'll detail below. 5.45pm I let the couple who was enjoying the hot tub know that it was time to wrap it up. They left pretty quickly, no fuss, and I straightened up the chairs they had pulled over to use. I put down all the open umbrellas and I locked the gates with my master key. I had never realized it, but there had been two locks in each of the entry gates. 
I suppose I never noticed it because only one keyhole was on the outside. My master lock simply locked me in. I headed to the guard chair and I started scrolling through my phone. 6.45 PM. The sun was just setting behind the mountains. It was a really pretty sight, coming from such a flat state. The weather was perfect. It was quiet by the water and I was keeping myself relatively entertained. The first hour down, I thought. 7.15 PM. The last ray of sunlight disappeared from the sky and it was getting dark quickly. The light from the pool lit up a pretty big portion of the area and the clubhouse was behind my chair so I had the light from the scotches as well, so it wasn't so bad. It was still quiet though, but something about being alone in the dark made the quiet feel uneasy. First night jitters maybe, but I really felt unnerved. 7.30 PM I realized that I was so unnerved because I couldn't hear the water. Normally I could hear the blips from it going into the filters, but it was as still as glass. 8.45 PM It wasn't quiet anymore. I couldn't tell what I could hear but it was there very suddenly. The water was still absolutely static, but I could hear it splashing. Somewhere. I walked all around the pool's edge but nothing moved. I couldn't pinpoint the splashing sound either. The hot tub was also off, still in silent. I went back to my chair and I tried to ignore it. 9.30 PM There were ripples in the pool. The water still splashed from somewhere but now there were ripples coming from the center. I knew that it was 9.30 because I had texted Mr. Karras and asked if there was a hidden filtration system that I couldn't see that was making all of the noise. But when I looked up, ripples. It was a relief at first but they also seemed to sort of off and that's when I realized that they all originated from the dead center. 10 PM She asked me what I was doing. I was so startled by the sound of her voice that I gasped and I gripped my chair almost breaking my phone. There was a little girl in the center of the pool, head and shoulders above the water looking up at me. I never heard her get into the pool. I didn't hear her swim at that spot. I didn't hear the gates open or close. And it made me panic. Honey, what are you doing in the water? The pool is closed. She just kept looking at me. Sweetie, you need to come out of the water. Nothing. Now, I'm not a big fan of children in general, but this was just too much for me. No little ninja child was going to creep me out and get me in trouble on my first night. What is your name? Sophia. Sophia, I need you to get out of the water. I, I try, try to, to, but I, I can't. can't. Slowly a wicked grin crossed her face. I can't, I can't but, but you can, you can help, help me. me. Help, help me, please. me please. Nope. That smile grew wider and wider and it looked like her cheeks were about to rip from how much it was stretching. I looked at my phone to dial Mr. Carlson the moment I pressed the call button. She vanished. I looked in the water. I looked around the chairs. Nothing. Part of me was worried that since I hadn't heard her come in, I wouldn't have heard her get out of the pool. So I searched while the phone rang. He didn't answer. So when his voice will ask me to leave a message, I said, Hi, it's me. I'm so sorry and I don't know how but there's a little girl here and now I can't find her. I don't know what to do. I hung up and there she was. The same spot in the water, looking at me with that smile. I look around to see how she had gotten into the water and she was gone again. No thank you. I ran to the nearest gate and I stuck my key in the master lock. I turned it and I turned it, waiting for it to catch and click. But it didn't stop turning, making full circles over and over. I'm not stupid, I know how keys and locks work but this lock wasn't acting right. I ran to the next one. Same thing. Right as I turned to run to the next one, I saw her now at the edge closest to me. 
What are you doing? She asked again. Are you letting me out? My heart dropped. I didn't care about any rules. I didn't care about any money. I was trapped in the pool area with a disappearing girl with a smile that could stretch for half a mile. I needed out of here. Help me, please. What do you want from me? I yelled. She laughed. Her laugh echoed against the walls of the clubhouse and rang so loud on my ears that I couldn't hold back my tears. You're so, You're so funny. funny. I just want to just leave, wanna leave the, pool. the pool. Now. Now. And again, just as suddenly as before, she was gone. This was my chance. I gripped the metal bars of the gate and I tried to hoist myself up and over. Screw this pool. But the more I tried to climb over, the higher the bars seemed to feel. My feet were never able to get more than a few inches off the ground, but I swear the bars were always a few feet higher than I could reach. I was losing it. Help, Help me. me! I screamed out. Help, Help me! Please, please let me, let me out. out! My voice echoed too, but there seemed to be no life outside of these gates. I felt so trapped and frightened. No, no one, one helps, helps us in here. here. The little girl's voice was right behind me, and I took off running to the clubhouse doors. The handles wouldn't budge and the key didn't fit the keyhole. I rambled the burglar bars on the window portions and I started crying hysterically. You're, You're so, so funny. funny. She said it more quietly this time. No, no one, one helps us get out. out. But you could get, get me out and, out and I'll, I'll get you I'll out, get out too. too. She laughed that awful, echoing laugh again, and I huddled into a ball. I stayed that way until it stopped. 11.45 PM. It didn't feel like more than an hour, but somehow it was. My arms hurt from shaking so hard and gripping myself in the fetal position, and I was hiccuping. But it was silent again, and the water was glassy again. After a few more minutes, I finally convinced myself to stand up, looking over the pool. The little girl was down at the bottom, right at the floor, motionless under the water. Chairs were toppled over and the tables were flipped upside down. The leaves and debris were in soggy piles all over. I didn't make a sound. I backed up to the wall of the clubhouse and I watched the water. It felt like she moved when I didn't have eyes on her so I refused to look away. 12 AM I blinked and I jumped when my phone alarm went off, scaring me half to death. But she was gone. I turned off my alarm as quickly as I could and I ran to the gate, shoving in the key again and turning it. It clicked. I started crying when the gate unlocked. I didn't even care if the gate closed behind me. I ran home, I locked the doors and I closed the windows, and I sat on my bed. And here we are. Tears are still streaming down my face. I needed to get this off my chest because I just got a text from Mr. Karras. Let's talk tomorrow. I'm so sorry, but nobody would take the job if they knew about Sophia. Thanks to everybody who wanted to make sure that I was okay in my last post. I'm writing this after coming to the pool tonight before anything crazy happens. I didn't sleep at all after I'd gotten home. I couldn't. Every time I would close my eyes and I would start to drift off, I could hear that echoing laugh and see that impossible skin-splitting smile. Come 6am, I had given up and I sat on my couch clutching my coffee like it was my last shred of sanity. Around 7, I got another text from Mr. Carls. When you're ready, meet you by the clubhouse. I'm so sorry again. If you just want to collect your money and go, I understand. The very thought of going back to the pool so soon freaked me out. How many times had I swam in that water, passed through that same spot that she had stared at me, unblinking? Smiling, laughing. I wasn't ready to go back. Actually, what I really managed to do was text my real boss and say that I couldn't do any work from home today. Something had come up. I left it vague enough to not have to lie and sound like I needed to be institutionalized, but firm enough not to be asked questions. 
I read over what I wrote for all of you once, twice, and even three times. Each time, I could see it so clearly that I had to close my computer and sit in the quiet, just to make sure that the laughter stopped ringing in my ears. The third time I read it, my doorbell rang. God, if that's what a heart attack feels like, I never want to feel that again. It jarred me into reality and only when it rang a second time did I decide to be brave enough for 10 seconds and check through the people. Mr. Carls, I called through the door. My voice was shaking pathetically and I had the image of a helpless girl in a horror movie calling out to her killer for just a moment before he turned a face towards the people and he smiled. Hey, I'm glad you're home. He responded. Can we talk? I brought your money. I glanced at the clock. It was about noon. He must have gotten tired of waiting. You can put it under the door. Are you sure? He fidgeted a little. His round face scrunched up like he was trying to convince himself either to stay or go. I figured you wanted to know what was going on. I'm uninterested. Of course it was a lie. I had a million burning questions. But I was also desperately tired and completely terrified. And I was about 10 words from breaking down into tears. He frowned. His frown pulled his whole face down. The way this man emoted it tugged at my heartstrings so badly that I had to let him in. I couldn't help it. I hate seeing people be so upset. When the door opened, he scuttled inside and he shut it behind him. Thank you, here's your money. I took the envelope and I didn't bother counting it. So, are you okay? I think he really meant it. He had real concern over me. So yeah, I started bawling. The round man patted my shoulders as they shook with the force. I crumpled to the ground and he slowly struggled to kneel down next to me. I was too tired to feel awkward about it. I'm sorry. I choked out. I haven't slept or eaten. I was so freaked out, I couldn't leave. I was locked in with her and she just kept laughing and... I don't know. Why didn't you tell me? He looked ashamed. I don't know. I haven't had to hire someone who wasn't family before. I was so quick to close the pool because I didn't know how to find someone new. After Joshua left, it was all I could do to convince Mark to stay. It took me an embarrassingly long time to piece together these new names. It's obvious to me now. Joshua was the weekend lifeguard that had quit, and Mark was the weekday one. I just stared at the ground. I didn't like that answer. So they're your sons, nephews? My sons. He hesitated. They both knew about Sophia because they were around when the accident happened. They had agreed to help keep her contained. But Joshua wanted to go to college, leave the town. And I finally had no argument against him doing it. What accident? I looked up at him. He did that thing again where he seemed to stare straight through me. Not looking at me at all but seeing something far away. We sat quietly for maybe five agonizing minutes. Before we started speaking very slowly. About eight years ago, Sophia and her mother lived in these apartments. Her mother was in the process of divorcing the father, and Sophia would like to come to the pool to stay out of the heated household. Joshua and Mark would play with her in the water nearly every day that summer. The days started getting shorter and the sun started setting earlier. I guess Sophia thought that the fighting was worse after dark, so she started to go to the pool later. One night when her parents were busy screaming and fighting, just a pointless fight, that they didn't notice her walking right out of the front door. It must have been around 8 or 9 p.m., right when the pool was closing. My sons were headed to the hot tub to get out of the house, so they saw her walk into the pool. They hated seeing her so sad, so they decided to play in the water with her. He shook his head and was quiet for another minute. I barely allowed myself to breathe. I didn't want to break the spell of the story that he was telling. They were just older boys. They roughhoused in the water, it's normal. 
the way that they were playing was no different than any other time. But I guess when they dunked her underwater, she had taken in some water into her lungs. I don't know. The doctors said that even though she came up for air, she had gotten enough in that she was drowning, even above water. Dry drowning, they call it. His voice lowered. When the boys decided to go home, she wanted to swim for a little bit longer. They lingered in the hot tub. It was dark and the pool was technically supposed to be closed. And she just wanted to float on her back for a little while. She loved that. It made her feel peaceful. His eyes refocused on me. The boys said that when they encouraged her to go, she wasn't acting right. Irrational, just kept laughing. It didn't want to stop floating. She kept coughing, but the boys thought it was from all that laughter. Eventually, she stopped and asked the boys to help her out of the pool. They jumped in, but she was gone so suddenly, they didn't know what to do. They left her there and they ran for help. I think Joshua blames himself even now for not at least trying to pull her out. It's hard to say that if she was dead when they jumped in, or after everybody came out when they heard them screaming. But all it took was a little bit of water in her lungs for her to drown. I felt a chill down my spine. The idea of drowning was scary enough, but slowly drowning while you're not even underwater. Even thinking about it now, I fear ever taking a sip of soda the wrong way and letting it go into my lungs. Is that why she's laughing in the pool at night? It was the obvious conclusion, but it sounded ridiculous coming out of my mouth. I shook my head at myself, but he nodded. She wants help out. I hugged my knees as he adjusted his position, clearly uncomfortable on the ground like that. She wants help out. He repeated, but there's something wrong about her. Her smile is wrong. She doesn't speak like she did when she was alive. It's like Sophia, but not. And I just don't want any other children having an accident. And I fear that Sophia isn't happy being alone in the water. Another shiver down my spine. She definitely felt sinister last night. The smile was what really got me. It was just a simple accident. What would make her haunt the pool? He didn't answer. Slowly, he wobbled up into a standing position again and straightened out his polo shirt. I would rather let people enjoy the pool, have an escape from whatever is happening at home. Sophia needed an escape. But if I don't have somebody to protect the pool at night, I can't keep it open. I would sooner fill it with cement than let another parent suffer such a terrible loss in my pool. Something about that clicked to me. Here's this older, chubby man with red cheeks and a receding hairline, who just wants people to enjoy something like this little girl that he feels responsible for. I get it, I really do, but I can't be there again. I felt ashamed saying it. I thought I was going crazy, I couldn't leave, I couldn't call for help, and it felt like she was tormenting me. I'm sorry Mr. Carls, but that's not some sweet little girl in that water. He closed his eyes and he took a breath. Listen, she can move the water to create mayhem around the tables, and she can laugh and make you feel like you only hear that laugh for as long as you live. She can beg you to let her out and make you desperate to help her just to make it stop. But in the eight years that I've been making sure she's kept safe, she has shown me one thing. He opened his eyes again. She can't leave the pool. I was expecting something more. It wasn't really sinking in. Yeah, that's why she asked for help. No, what I mean is, if you don't go into the water, she can't touch you. She can splash at you and even whip around the leaves and gunk and everything else. But if you don't reach into the water, she can't touch you. She can't make the water touch you. She can't do anything to you at all. So what you're saying is, if you can deal with her laugh and her begging, you're completely safe. He reached into his back pocket and he pulled out his wallet. I told you 20 per hour. I can afford up to 25. 
but that's maxing me out. That's nearly what I get paid to manage the grounds here. But I can't keep my son here for help and he wants to move on with his life and not be reminded of what he saw. Please, think about my offer and I can promise you that you'd be safe. It's good money. But if I can't keep you, I'm going to close the pool before another accident happens. And so I showed him out of the door, not accepting the cash in hand and went back to gripping my now cold cup of coffee. I was thinking about it over and over. I could tell myself it was like high stress babysitting, but she wouldn't let me ignore her. I mean, I had spent over an hour last night trying to ignore her laugh and it paralyzed me with fear. And while I understood it at first, I was starting to let my anxiety make me skeptical about Mr. Carl's. If the pool was so dangerous, he could have cemented it over the day he realized that it was haunted. Why was he so protective of it? I picked up the guilt in his voice before. It felt very real. But something about what he said was artificial. I've always preferred to watch drama unfold from a safe distance, sure. But this would be shoving my face into something that my anxiety told me that was much bigger than myself. At 4 p.m., I texted him. $25 an hour, and you keep your ringer on and answer me if I call. If you don't, I leave. He texted back. Thank you. I went in at 5.45 on the dot. I ushered the few lingering kids out. I cleaned up the messes left behind by innocent and oblivious poolgoers. I sat down in the lifeguard chair. And now I'm just waiting. I've been waiting since 6 p.m. and it's currently 8.45. It's dark and I can already hear the splashing sounds coming from nowhere. And when she finally decides to visit me, I have a few questions that I want to ask before she starts tormenting me. I'm not sure if I'm doing this right and I'm not sure if this will mean anything to anyone, but I know that I have to try. My name is Joshua Carls and what I'm about to tell you I believe is 100% true. I found this phone in a bush by the pool this morning. It was unlocked and the story I'm going to post was already written. I think I'm supposed to share it here. The person who wrote it has been missing for a few days. I think after reading this, you'll know why. 9 p.m. What, what are you doing? doing? She got my attention just like last night, with one simple phrase. She was there in the center of the pool just like last time, head and shoulders above the water. I'm waiting for you, Sophia. I replied calmly, but my heart was racing. Why? Why? The smile hasn't gotten to her yet. She had these big doe eyes, and bloodshot but innocent. I never noticed how sad she looked, considering all that laughter. I want to play a game. I sat down near the edge of the pool. It's a question game, and if you answer enough questions, I'll let you out. I took a few deep breaths. It was easier to be brave before she appeared. She just stared at me. Sophia, do you want to play my game? I did my best to smile at her. No, no tricks? tricks? Her voice was soft. You'll, You'll play, play fair. fair. I'll play fair. The splashing noise disappeared, and she was suddenly right in front of me, at the edge of the water. I'll start easy, okay? How long have you been here? She stared off through me, into a different time and place. Honestly, I was getting pretty tired of that happening with people. A long, a long time, time, I guess, I guess. she said. But, but it's, it's just, just always so, so dark, dark that, that I can't, I can't tell. tell. Okay, good answer. Next question. What happened when you got into the pool, and before you couldn't leave? I don't, I don't like, like this, this question. question. She snapped at me and I did my best to hide my tears. For a moment, the splashing noises started up again. I'm sorry, Sophia. Can you tell me a little so I can count it as answered? You don't have to tell me everything. The splashing subsided. My pulse didn't know. She stared at me. 
the faintest twitch of a smile appeared at the edge of her lips. Daddy, Daddy was, was mad, mad again. again. He was always, he was mad, always mad after, after dinner. dinner. He chased he mommy chased into the mommy kitchen, into the and, kitchen they and they were screaming. I was crying, I was and, crying and I tried to tell, them to, tried to tell them to stop. But, but... The smile twitched upwards a little more. He hit he, me. He did that he did a lot when he drank his beers. His beers. He told me he to told go to hell and he spit at me. He spit at me. When he let go of me, he started yelling at mommy again. I wanted to hide in my room, but the yelling was so loud. It echoed in my ears and I just wanted it to stop. So I decided to go to the pool. She looked up at me. I waited a moment to see if she would continue, but she didn't. That was very brave of you, Sophia. Thank you. Her smile creeped up a little further. I continued. So our next question is a hard one too. But you did a very good job with the last one. I want to know what you think of Mark and Joshua. Your friends from the pool. They're not, They're not my, my friends. friends. She said. It wasn't with animosity or anger. But like someone disputing something obvious. Like no, the sky isn't green. They aren't? Her smile was fully visible now. They're my, my brothers. brothers. My heart dropped. Really? I thought I was going to be sick. Joshua, Joshua and Marky always, always tried to cheer me, cheer me up when there was, when sun. There was sun. But now that but I'm in the dark, the dark, they never help me. me. What makes you say that? Daddy, Daddy wants, wants me to, me to stay, stay in the, in the pool. pool. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Mr. Carl's was not only Sophia's father, but he was abusive and something was telling me he was responsible for how weird the pool was at night. The fact that the gates were locked when you tried to leave, the bars on all the clubhouse windows towards the pool, when there weren't any out front, the fact that he kept his sons guarding the place until one couldn't take it anymore. Sophia... There is no hiding the shaking in my voice. Do you know what time you died? The smile was practically tearing her cheeks. Midnight. Midnight. She started laughing. The sounds bouncing off invisible walls all around me. I could tell that her smile was growing through my blurry vision. I clasped my hands to my ears and I sat in the fetal position. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. You said you, you said wanted, you to, wanted play to play a game. game. You're, so, You're silly. so silly. You're so, You're funny. so funny. I couldn't get her voice out of my head. It sounded like she was laughing from somewhere inside of me. You're, You're so, so funny. funny. You're so, You're so fun. fun. Did, I Did I win yet? yet? Please. Please. Help, me out. Help me out. I don't know how long I was out for, but my phone showed 11.30 when I came to. She was at the bottom of the pool, silent, eyes closed. I'm dizzy, but I'm making a decision right now. I'm writing all this out for everybody to know that I'm letting her out. I don't know what that's going to do and I'm scared, but I think that she is scared too. I think that if I let her out, she'll be free from whatever is making her smile. I think she'll find peace. My name is Joshua Carls and I am so sorry. I live with the fact that I let my dad control the three of us for so long. Every day. I don't know what else to say. I'm probably going to break this phone and toss it. It's wrong, but I have to protect myself and my brother from being implicated in something. Sophia hasn't come back though. But the girl that my dad conned into being my replacement hasn't either.